from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello and welcome to Behind the Horror. Scary movie fans, such as myself, will hear that a movie is based on a true story. Now, a few of them we know, but most... Well, we'll never go on to find out just what that true story is. So in this series, we will explore and find out exactly what the true story is behind the movies we love. Special thanks to some of my patrons as always. Elena, Aaron, Katorez, Catherine, Sam, Linda, Janice, Hammer, Katarina, Florence, Teresa, Sarah, Sophie, Nanette, Two Emmas, Emily, Gabrielle, Galen, Cassandra, Bree, David, John, and Judy. Thank you so, so much. You guys are truly appreciated. So with the release of the new Candyman movie last week, the release date actually being August 27th, 2021, I figure we best get the true story behind this movie. This new one is, of course, not the first, as the first Candyman was released back in 1992. I was pretty young when I saw it, and I know it scared the crap out of me. There were, of course, the inevitable sequels and so on. So let's discuss the basic premise behind the first movie, Candyman, and what true story might have inspired it. And also the movie is based on the book, The Forbidden by Clive Barker. In the original 1992 movie, we start with a bird's eye view of a big city, traffic interlocking and merging. It's the daily hustle and bustle that everyone's used to. Then we see what looks like a sea of bees as we hear a voice say, quote, they will say they have shed innocent blood. What's blood for if not for shedding? With my hook for a hand, I will split you from your groin to your gullet, end quote. And then the bees began to swarm and take flight over Chicago, creating nearly a black cloud in the sky. The voice then finishes with, quote, I came for you, end quote. Then we see a very pretty woman smoking a cigarette, listening to and recording another woman tell a story about how a friend of hers was babysitting for a couple when a male friend of hers showed up. The babysitter and the male friend ran upstairs, the babysitter having taken her shirt off, and they shut themselves in the bathroom. Do these people not know the rules of horror films? The babysitter asks the male friend if he's ever heard of the Candyman. Babysitter then says his right hand has been sawed off, replaced with a hook. She says if you say his name five times in the mirror, he will appear behind you, breathing down your neck. She invites the male friend to try it. So the male friend looked in the mirror and said Candyman, but only four times. The babysitter tells him to go downstairs and wait for her, so he goes and sits on the couch and drinks a beer. The babysitter, still in the bathroom, said Candyman the one last final time in the mirror. Then when turning off the light, just as the Candyman appears behind her, the scene cuts back downstairs where a scream can be heard, a hole appears in the ceiling and blood begins to pour from it. The scene then cuts back to the two ladies, the storyteller saying the male's hair turned white from shock. She says that the male got away, but the candy man killed the girl and the baby she was supposed to be watching. We then find out two women, Helen and Bernadette, are interviewing students who are telling the same story, but as these things go, the details always differ a bit. But this is their thesis. 
Candyman. We hear others telling stories about 30-foot-long alligators that now live in the sewers. We are then taken into a large college classroom where these types of themes are being discussed. Modern oral folklore, the professor says. We then see that the professor and the first interviewer, Helen, are actually married. Helen then later is doing her due diligence and researching deaths where the victims all had similar causes of death, and there are whispers that these kills belong to the Candyman. A possible serial killer? Some newspapers print this, and she researches into the night. She finds out that one of these murders that fits the description of the Candyman happened in a building nearly identical to hers. Of course, her building has been completely remodeled and the apartment that the murder happened in has not. Helen shows Bernadette, who has come over to visit, after pulling the mirror off the wall in her bathroom, that there's a hole behind it. Absolutely no wall. She puts the mirror back on the wall and they decide to say his name into the mirror together, only Bernadette stops at four, whereas Helen says it the fifth time, and yet nothing happens. The next day, the two women are on their way to a more rundown side of Chicago to do some more interviews. Bernadette is nervous about the gangs that run that area, but Helen is insistent that they go. They arrive at a rather sketchy building and enter an old apartment that is completely torn up but is identical to her own in layout. So she knows which door it is to the bathroom. She opens it and predictably there is a mirror still on the wall. They open the medicine cabinet mirror to see a hole in the wall behind it. Helen takes pictures of the hole, but it is evident that Bernadette is anxious to get the hell out of there. Helen then crawls into the hole to investigate if the murderer possibly came through that hole and if there might be anything back there. She takes her camera, begins to take pictures, and is exploring the space. She crawls through another hole through a graffitied, drawn picture of a man with his mouth wide open. On the floor, she finds candy that someone was attempting to put razor blades in, as back in the apartment, Bernadette continues to wait anxiously in the bathroom. Helen finally emerges and Bernadette insists that they leave. A woman who lives in the building inquires why they are there and they ask if they can interview her. She agrees. She tells them that she heard a scream the night of the murder, right through the walls, she says. The woman says she is scared for herself and her baby and that she feels the murderer will never be caught. She then reveals that she believes the candy man killed her neighbor. Fast forward to dinner out with friends and another man who has studied the lore of the Candyman who reveals that the legend began in the late 1800s. The villain was the son of a slave, but his father had made quite a bit of money creating a device that could mass produce shoes. Candyman was able to go to the best schools, had been part of polite society, and was actually a talented artist. So Candyman was commissioned by a wealthy landowner to come paint a portrait of his beautiful daughter. So of course they fall in love. She becomes pregnant and her father enraged. He paid someone who chased Candyman to the land where the old dilapidated apartment complex now stands and cut off his right hand with a rusty blade. Helen is sitting listening to this man in spellbound silence. He kept telling the story. While his hand being removed, there was apparently a beehive nearby. The man who assaulted Candyman smashed the hive, took the honey, and smeared it all over Candyman's exposed body, and he was stung to death. His body was then burned, his ashes spread all over that land. Soon after, Helen returns to the old apartment building and asks a little boy to show where the Candyman is. 
He takes her to a nearby small building and she begins taking more pictures as he tells her a story about another person who had been killed by, you guessed it, the Candyman. So of course she goes into the building, which is a bathroom that is quite obviously still used though not maintained in years. She gags as she opens the stall doors where feces has been used to write on the walls. She lifts the lid on a toilet and discovers it's full of bees. Outside, a man approaches the boy waiting for Helen to come out. The little boy says, Candy man, as that man enters the bathroom. Helen excuses herself, but a group of young men enter, one of them holding a hook in his hand. The scene cuts to the young men leaving the bathroom, and the young boy enters to check on Helen. He finds her bleeding and bruised on the floor. Now, this is obviously not the real Candyman, as Helen survives her attack. She is able to identify her attacker at the police station, thankfully. Later, as Helen is walking through a parking garage, putting the negatives of the photos that she's been taking into her purse on her way to her car, she hears an ominous voice say, Helen. She turns and looks around, and there she sees a man in the distance standing in the parking garage. He says, quote, Helen, I came for you. While she's hearing this voice, she gets these flashes of the graffitied face in her mind. It's the Candyman. He begins to approach her, and she is mesmerized, but also not wanting to move, tears streaming down her face. He says, quote, be my victim, end quote. So what happens next? Well, those of us that have seen the movie already know, and the rest of you will get to watching it. There's a new one. But either way, this too is loosely based on a true story, the murder of Ruthie Mae McCoy. So Ruthie was born in Hughes, Arkansas in about 1935. She was one of eight children. While she was still very young, her family moved to Chicago's South Side, believing it would be a great opportunity. And just like so many stories, that was just not the case. Her family barely scraped by. Her father loaded coal into wagons, earning a very small paycheck. Her mother was devoutly religious, according to one of her brothers. So Ruthie went through to about one year of high school, but she began to show small signs of something amiss, though others would say they didn't notice anything until she was at least 20 years old. People said that they hadn't known what was wrong with her, only that she often talked to herself or randomly cursed at perfect strangers out in public and with no provocation or motive she would eventually be diagnosed with residual type schizophrenia. So what's that exactly? So there are five different subtypes of schizophrenia. There's paranoid type, disorganized, catatonic, undifferentiated, and residual. Residual is used to describe a patient who isn't currently experiencing prominent delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, or catatonic behaviors, but are usually experiencing at least two of those symptoms to a lesser extent. They call it the residual phase of schizophrenia. A person who has schizophrenia might report not having any negative symptoms, putting them in this phase, of course, but it doesn't mean that they are magically cured. But regardless, due to this, she had a very difficult time maintaining any type of employment for longer than about a month. But she did work as a laundromat attendant and sometimes a housekeeper and so on. At 27 years old, Ruthie gave birth to her daughter, Vernita, and raised her as a single mother. But that was no cakewalk for the mentally ill mom. Sometimes Vernita had to live with relatives off and on because Ruthie had to be institutionalized several times throughout her life and even after Vernita was grown. 
Her daughter said that her mother was able to function pretty well when she took her medications. In fact, her daughter stated that when she was doing good, well, her hygiene would be good. Her communication skills were much improved and she would dress appropriately according to the actual weather outside on top of societal expectations. So it was reported that in the beginning of 87, she was doing really well, going to a guidance center three times a week, working to get her GED, taking up crafts and excelling in group therapy sessions. But even with the medications, Ruthie was still extremely anxious and distrustful of others. An acquaintance said, quote, she'd say, can I trust so-and-so to get my lunch and bring me my change? And we'd tell her, hey, you can trust anybody here. They're not going to take advantage of you like they do in the projects. Even though these people are from the project, they don't act that they were, end quote. So back in 1983, 48-year-old Ruthie got an apartment in ABLA Homes. This was a Chicago Housing Authority public housing development that made up four separate public housing projects on the near west side of Chicago. The letters in ABLA stand for the four building development acronyms. This public housing was located near Cabrini Green, the setting for the movie. But she didn't want to be there and in public housing and was doing her best to get out of the projects in 1987. First off, the now 52-year-old had been approved for disability, so she could finally be able to get some level of income. Not long after she had first moved into the apartment, Vernita, her two children, and her boyfriend moved in with Ruthie. And of course the boyfriend and the mother did not get along. She apparently was constantly suggesting the boyfriend would abandon his children just as Vernita's father had done to her. Later interviewed, the boyfriend said, quote, She thought black men was all no good. All they wanted to do was flirt and run around. End quote. Vernita moved them out a couple of years later. But anyway, these projects were described in the Chicago Reader as, quote, the most dangerous buildings in ABLA. A claustrophobe in a closet might be more at ease than a paranoid like McCoy in an Abbott high-rise. The buildings feature dark, malfunctioning elevators, pitch black stairwells, and cocaine and PCP addicts on nearly every floor. Fiends really are lurking in the shadows here, in these towers. You're crazy if you're not always looking over your shoulder." End quote. So there's that. She lived on the 11th floor of a 15-story building. So once she qualified for disability, they retroed her payments back from the date she first applied for it. So her first check was sizable, for the times especially. It was in the amount of about $2,000. Now she planned on using that money to get a place to live in a better area, but she did want to get herself some new clothes and, you know, a couple of household items. It was reported that she bought absolutely nothing flashy or expensive, but nonetheless, it did not go unnoticed. Not long after, while riding in a van that took her to and from an outpatient psychiatric center at Mount Sinai Hospital, Ruthie told another passenger, quote, someone has threatened my life, end quote. Now the passenger told her to tell the staff at the hospital, but Ruthie said she didn't want to get anyone else involved. Eight days later, late April, 1987, the Chicago Police Department received a 911 call from Ruthie. She was frantically trying to tell the dispatcher that people had thrown her, quote, cabinet down, meaning her medicine cabinet with a bathroom mirror, and were coming through the bathroom. But the dispatcher taking the call couldn't seem to make sense of what they were hearing. But they sent an officer to the location to check on her. But since the call wasn't listed as a break-in, but rather just a disturbance, the officer knocked on the door and got no response. 
at the station, more and more calls were coming in from that same area stating they had heard gunshots, shouting and screaming. Again, several police officers arrived at the door and knocked, but since no one came to the door, and again thinking it was just a disturbance, they turned around and left. Now, a couple of officers went to the complex's management office to ask for a key so they could let themselves in and see if Ruthie was okay. But for whatever reason, the key they were provided would not work on the lock, so they too left. After that, in came the follow-up reports from concerned neighbors who wondered what the police had found out. The next evening, the police would receive yet another call from one of Ruthie's neighbors. This one stated that Ruthie greeted her every single morning and evening, and she had not seen her since the day before. So officers went to do another welfare check on Ruthie only to encounter the same problem. No one came to the door, so again, they left. Witnesses later interviewed said that they saw two men carrying Ruthie's TV and a rocking chair of all things around the property in the dark morning hours after she had been killed. But that neighbor that Ruthie had an actual relationship with wouldn't give up. Upset at the fact that the police had done nothing further, she contacted the property management. The management sent a couple of people to Ruthie's apartment and were able to finally get the door open. What they found inside was a horrific scene. Ruthie was found in her bedroom, lying on the floor in a pool of her own blood. She had been shot multiple times and killed. One bullet passed through her left shoulder, another through her left thigh. A third bullet entered the right side of her abdomen, going through her liver and exited out the other side. The fourth passed through her right arm into her chest and severed a pulmonary vein. And her apartment had been completely torn through. And keep in mind, guys, that she had unfortunately been there for a couple of days, so she was also beginning to decompose. The smell was immediate and overwhelming throughout the apartment. It was determined that the murderers had gained entry into Ruthie's apartment through a hole in the wall from the connecting apartment behind her medicine cabinet in her bathroom. But this was no shock to the other residents of the ABLA projects. It was said that people had been breaking into other people's apartments, oddly through the medicine cabinets, for over a year before this murder. It was stated that the apartments at the end of each floor had bathrooms that were separated by only two feet of tunnel space, originally created so that plumbers and general workers could easily access what they needed to for repairs. But the residents had been complaining for some time about adjacent apartments being vacant and the doorknobs missing so people would go in and squat and what have you. One woman interviewed said that she was calmly watching her TV a couple of months before the murder and literally saw a person dart out of her bathroom and right out through her front door. Just like that. Other residents who had known about the empty space behind the bathroom mirrors would put things in front of it to deter anyone coming in. I mean, can you imagine living like that? So eventually two men were arrested for her murder, but they were not found guilty in court. There just wasn't enough evidence. Now, most of the ABLA buildings have been demolished so that the city could develop Roosevelt Square, which is now allegedly a mixed income community. Only one building remains and it has been reportedly renovated. At one point, the ABLA complex housed over 17,000 residents, though only 8,500 were actually named or listed on the leases. At the time of Ruthie's death, the housing projects were rife with gang violence, drugs, and so on. 
It was said that you could not walk down the street without someone begging you for money or the fear of getting mugged for money for the drugs. So this is the true story behind the movie. And as I always do, I sat and reflected on the people involved. And I'm actually quite glad that I was able to tell Ruthie's story. So many times, people that don't quite fit the ideal cookie cutter existence, well, their stories often go untold and completely forgotten. It is apparent that Ruthie didn't have an easy life and pairing that with such a severe mental illness, I think she did the best she could. So tell me guys, what do you think? Leave me a comment below if you're watching or you can always DM me on Instagram at serial underscore killing. You can email me at serialkillinginstagram at gmail.com. Consider becoming a patron if you'd like and I've left my PO box below. And as always, thank you so much for listening because I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much and have a great day.